So for those of you who don't know, Trail BC is located in the southern interior of the province uh, on the banks of the beautiful Columbia River, about 10 kilometers north of the US border. So as you can see from this picture, the community has grown up around one of the world's largest lead and zinc smelting facilities. It's been in operation for over 125 years and remains in active operation today as a significant employer in the region. So for the community growing up or in close proximity to this industrial facility, um, it's created some unique challenges, including the potential for exposure to metals from, from the smelters operation. So a, a study uh, conducted in 1975 identified that, that children in trail had significantly higher blood lead levels than a, a nearby a comparison community. But it was a further study in, uh, in 1989 conducted by researchers at UBC uh, that showed that while those lead levels um, had declined since the, since the 1970s, there were still nearly 40% of children with blood lead levels over the, uh, the CDC's level of no concern, which at the time was 15 micrograms per deciliter. And it was this study that was pivotal in the creation of the trail lead task force, um, which brought together the community, municipal and provincial governments and the company uh, from the smelter to provide community education and case management whilst investigating lead exposure pathways and intervention options. So the exposure pathway study, this uh, cover of it is, is on this slide here, was a collaboration between the Trail Lead Task Force and researchers at the University of Cincinnati to identify the ways that children were being exposed to lead in the trail area. And we've got here the, um, the exposure pathways diagram. Um, we've updated it recently that we, that we still use to communicate with families um, to illustrate the various different ways that, that lead uh, can get into the home and, and that children can be exposed. So the key findings of that exposure pathway study uh, were that for kids under 18 months of age, uh, indoor house dust was the dominant source of lead exposure for children. And for kids over 18 months of age that have now started to, to stand up and move around a bit and go outside more, the time spent outdoors and uh, therefore the concentrations of lead in the soil were also significant sources. So the lead task force that I just kind of spoken to, it concluded in 2000, so it was a 10 year um, program, um, and made several recommendations for interventions which address many of those exposure pathways. And the result of those recommendations was the development of this comprehensive integrated program, um, which has continued to evolve based on uh, advances in, in science and understanding and also through adaptive management. And from about 2000 onward, the program became uh, the Trail Area Health and Environment Program, um, which is still overseen by a committee that includes the community, municipal and provincial governments and the company. So still a very collaborative, um, integrated uh, approach to um, tackling, tackling lead exposure in trail. So that's the background to the program. Um, and we're now going to speak to these five different program components that we've got on the slide here. So I'm gonna start with air quality. So the air quality program component um, includes smelter emissions reductions, dust control, uh, air quality monitoring, and also a working group uh, which continues to look at air quality uh, information and identify opportunities for improvement. So why air quality? Uh, well, the lead task force identified that emissions reductions 
were the single most effective way to reduce children's blood lead in trail. You can start to look at the influence of the air quality program over time. So here we, the, the chart goes back to uh, 1991, just after the lead task force had started. And we've got stack emissions in green and um, ambient air concentrations in blue. Uh, these are annual averages. And what you can see is in the early 90s, uh, stack emissions were, were high, uh, ambient air levels were high, and then something happened. Uh, in 1997, um, new smelting technology was uh, brought online at the smelter during a significant modernization program, and the stack emissions decreased significantly. At the same time, there was a concurrent decline in, in the ambient uh, air concentrations for lead in, in, in the community monitoring stations. And follow-up studies uh, after this, uh, this improvement was made also demonstrated that that reduction in stack emissions was a significant factor in decreasing uh, lead in outdoor dust bowl, in street dust, and critically in indoor dust bowl, um, with the result being a dramatic increase in blood lead levels. But what you'll also see on this chart is that uh, while stack emissions continued to decline to, to you know, uh, very, very low levels through the 2000s, the ambient lead levels actually plateaued. And what this did was highlight the influence of fugitive emissions. So those are emissions from roadways, from uh, outdoor stockpiles and mixing of stockpiles, from process equipment and from buildings that aren't from a single point source stack, but they're um, from various places on the site. And so this led to the uh, initiation of the Fugitive Dust Reduction Program uh, around 2012. And then you can see from that point on, we continue to see again, further declines in the ambient lead levels to what we have now is, is very historic lows. Uh, in, in trail. Uh, so I'm now going to hand over to Andrea to speak to the next component. Thank you, Claire. So the home and garden program, obviously the air quality that Claire spoke about, uh, people's homes and yards, we were the recipient of those air quality changes and emissions. And as such, we have a home and garden component of the program. Our key program areas are showing in the green bubble here. And um, we're operated out of a community program office. So this is a storefront in downtown trail where residents can come in and ask questions, sign up for programs and uh, also receive supports. Um, our programs that are noted are based on those exposure pathways findings from the trail led task force. Also, of course, on emerging science and uh, changing regulations as we adapt and on best practices and literature. So I'll describe a few of the key programs over the next slides and how we um, support the community through our home and garden program. Uh, so home visiting is a key component of our program and we deliver that through the Healthy Families Healthy Homes program, which we work with Interior Health on. Interior Health delivers the Healthy Families program and they will speak to that in a few moments. And we provide the Healthy Homes component, which uh, looks at uh, reducing exposure to lead uh, in children's home and yard environments. So it is a primary prevention program. It's available to everybody in the community, regardless of their participation in other components, such as the soils program or uh, the blood lead testing program. And it focuses on educating families about those exposure pathways and providing them with supports uh, to help address those potential exposure risks. So, for example, one of the um, 
components of the exposure pathways is the tracking in of dust and dirt from the outside environment to the indoor environment. And uh, some of the education that we provide around that are to recommend people leave boots and shoes, take the boots off at the door, pretty easy in Canada <laughs> in the middle of winter. Um, but we also provide doormats uh, so that to encourage that behavioral change in some cases. So those are some of the examples of supports that we provide to families around the education of the exposure pathways. For our enhanced support program, this is where um, children have been identified with an elevated blood lead level through the Interior Health Blood Lead Testing Clinic. And it's a more in-depth uh, secondary prevention program uh, where we follow up with more targeted supports specific to some of the risks that we might be seeing in that home and yard. Um, right now, one of the supports we're providing is a pilot project where we are uh, doing residential lead inspections. And these um, look at not only uh, the smelter related uh, impacts for lead in the yard and in the home, but also lead in paint and in water and even consumer products. So we're doing that um, currently, which is quite interesting. Um, of course, the children and the families are the key of our program. And both of these um, groups in the primary prevention and the enhanced supports, we are, they're also the priority for our yard programs. So our soil testing programs is uh, is completed under our soil management program. It all starts with our uh, voluntary soil testing that is available to all residents in the area. Um, however, priority is given to families with children under the age of 12. Um, with that, we also uh, provide a ground cover evaluation. So thinking back to that exposure pathways, diagram the we're looking at whether or not the soil is actually exposed and the accessible to the children and the residents on the property and from that we um, put our properties into a prioritization framework um, so obviously children are a priority areas with poor cover are a priority as well as the metals levels and we um, compare those metals levels to the age and the exposure um, in those bare soils uh, based on the prioritization, then we look for remediation options of the soil. So remediation can look a number of different ways. Uh, we have a lot of different constraints in our community um, with yards that are very difficult to access. Uh, and uh, also we have winter, so we focus these programs in the summer months. Um, the primary uh, or the remediation can look as ground cover improvements which is covering some of those bare areas possibly providing landscape fabric and putting mulch underneath a play structure in a place where a kid would frequent uh, also providing lawn care which can improve the health of the lawn and then um, act as a barrier to the soils below and we also offer soil replacement so that's excavating the yard, replacing it with clean cover and re-landscaping. So all those options are soil remediation options on a residential property. And we typically work on um, about 200 properties in a year, um, mostly properties with young children. Um, but not only the residential properties are the key of our soils. Uh, we have a property development program which works with um, properties, sometimes most commonly commercial uh, properties that are being developed, but also residential and working on managing the potential risks of soil um, and soil disposal throughout the development process. And then, of course, um, since families are the focus of our of our program, we work with the municipalities on uh, the same idea of soil testing, ground cover evaluation and remediation in the parks in the local area and uh, as a, a way to just uh, help the entire community with community greening and uh, here's some nice examples of good ground cover in the parks within the trail area. 
Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Megan to talk more about our family health program. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, so I'm Megan and I'm the public health nurse with the program. Um, so the Family Health Program, it's delivered by Interior Health. Um, so it's myself and with support and collaboration from um, Karen Goodison. She's the medical health officer responsible for the program, as well as support from the environmental public health and promotion and prevention um, aspects of Interior Health. So the goal for our program is to reduce health risks uh, for young children in trail from lead and other smelter metals and to promote uh, early childhood development outcomes. So in the orange bubble there, you can see sort of the key aspects to our program, which I'll talk about in further slides. And again, um, just as demonstrated by that picture from the exposure pathway, it all comes back to the children and their environment. Um, the timeline graphics there just show some key developments in our family health program. So in 1991 is when the annual blood lead um, testing program began. And in 2013, that's when we began our, our healthy family visit. Primary prevention is the most effective way to prevent exposure to children. So the goal with this is to provide targeted education and supports to families before children are exposed to lead in their environment. The goal of these visits is um, to offer a home visit to every child in trail before the age of one. Typically, my goal is to reach children when they're between four and six months of age. Um, it's an important period of development for children where they start to have a lot more hand to mouth activity and they're also spending a lot more time on the floor in their home as they start crawling and rolling around and stuff. So um, it's, a, it's a time when they can become you know, exposed to more lead in their environment. So during these visits, education information is provided on a variety of topics, including healthy nutrition, hand washing, how to access public health service, as well as early learning programs in the community as well. Um, also, I typically will review what's already mostly more often the healthy home visits already completed. So I'll just review with the family the key messages about dust reduction, both in the home and in the yard as well. So these visits are a great opportunity to answer questions that parents may have about blood lead testing. As you can probably imagine, a lot of parents are really nervous about bringing their babies in for blood lead testing. So it's really great to have that chance to answer their questions and, you know, calm any fears that they may have regarding the blood lead testing also allows parents to, you know, ask a variety of questions on other public health topics as well. So participation for these healthy family visits is typically about 90%. Um, and we do offer these visits to subsequent siblings as well, because each child is different in their behaviors and family situations do change year to year as well. Um, so secondary prevention. Um, so secondary prevention starts with our blood lead monitoring clinics. Um, and these are used to identify exposure. So our target population for these blood lead clinics is children six to 36 months of age. Um, so from in the beginning of the uh, early days of the lead task force, children from a wider range age range were invited six six months up to five years of age. But over the years, what the program found and our research has shown is that children over the age of three who didn't previously have an elevated blood lead are, are not likely to develop it after the age of three just due to changes in child behavior. So less hand to mouth activity, they're walking rather than crawling, those sorts of things. Um, we do, however, offer testing to a wider age range when parents request it. So sometimes that's families of children that have moved into the area over age three. Um, children that are enhanced support, so with a, an elevated blood lead, they continue to participate in our blood lead clinics, and as well as um, other areas um, nearby. So uh, neighboring communities will often request blood lead testing as well. The main clinic is held over six days in September. Uh, the reason for that timing in September is because our research has shown that blood lead levels um, do vary seasonally and tend to be higher after warmer and drier months. So typically in trail, July and August are quite dry and dusty. So we time our clinics to capture those results. We do have a follow-up clinic in February. That one is for younger babies that weren't quite old enough to make our September clinic. We don't want them to wait a whole year before their initial blood lead testing. And as well, it's a good opportunity for follow-up blood lead testing for children that did have a higher result the previous fall. Um, so enhanced support. Um, 
we offer enhanced support to all children with a blood lead result uh, greater than five uh, micrograms per deciliter. So this uh, threshold has changed recently. In the fall of 2020, we formally moved to this five micrograms per deciliter. Previously, we offered enhanced support um, when it was greater than 10 for children over a year or greater than seven for under a year. Um, but this new, this new threshold aligns with the U.S. Center for Disease Control reference level and as well as the value that the BC Center for Disease Control has adopted for children in the rest of BC as well. So typically, um, enha enhanced supports begin with a follow-up home visit from myself, um, where it's it's a bit more detailed and specific for that for that specific child and family. We explore the potential exposure pathways, including the home, behavior, nutrition, hobbies the family may participate in, um, as well as sometimes work or carry home if the parents are employed at a at a lead-based industry. Then, with the parents' consent, I'll inform the home and garden office. Um, that the child does meet this, this threshold and then they will also follow up with additional supports as well. So our supports, they're individual and targeted to meet families where they're at. The capacity for change for these families varies and we try to work with families to set goals that are realistic for them. Um, so that being said, supports are different for everyone, but some things we may offer include housekeeping or a disposal bin to help manage clutter to enable them to clean better in their home, um, as well as referrals to other community agencies as well. Uh, Andrea already spoke to the residential led pilot program that's underway this year. Um, so this is really exciting for us and hopefully this pilot program will enable us to have more targeted uh, information for families to focus on. Okay, so this slide here um, shows our geomean of blood lead levels in trail um, from when our annual blood lead testing began in 1991 and goes right up to our most recent result in the fall of 2020. Um, so you can see over time the geomean has decreased from about 13.5 micrograms per deciliter in 1991 down to 2.3 in the fall of 2020. So things we've learned um, through the lead task force days is that blood lead levels do typically peak for children um, around 18 to 24 months of age. And like I said before, it's rare for a child to develop an elevated blood lead result after their third birthday. Um, the two blue lines down the bottom, those are the Canadian and US geomeans. Um, as you can see, the age range for children um, there is different. There's no direct comparison to what we do in trail, so it's hard to give like an apples to apples comparison, but just to give you a general understanding of where our, where our kids in trail sit compared to, to their counterparts in other communities. Uh, also noted on this slide is some important um, events that have influenced uh, blood lead levels and trails. So you can see uh, when you uh, when gasoline was banned from, or sorry, lead was banned from gasoline uh, in '97 is the Kibsat smelter, and then there were also some production curtailments at at Tech, and you can see those little dips there in those two years in the early 2000s. Okay, so in this slide, it's kind of, uh, it puts it puts the two together. So the top red line there is the children's geo means. And then the other slides are the air quality um, results that Claire presented on earlier. Um, so this slide gives you a really good overview to see that how that influence of air quality has affected children's blood lead levels over the years and trail. Um, again, you can see on the, the timeline highlights there of significant uh, developments in our program. So this is a overview. Um, our the Trail Health and Environment Program. We really value ongoing monitoring, evaluation, and continuous improvement to keep on track to reduce exposure to lead in the community. Uh, we're engaged with stakeholders and respond to new information and priorities, and uphold uphold the public's trust to use our resource as well. The timeline here do documents the key highlights for our program to date. It begins in 1990 when the lead task force was established and includes up to the expansion of the soil remediation program in 2019. Here you can see some progress that we've made. So um, we've done over 1,200 lead safe renovation supports, uh, 1,600 soil assessments in the trail area. There's been over 500 uh, healthy family and healthy home visits since 2013, and as well as 600 uh, soil management interactions as well. As you've seen on the charts there, air quality and blood lead levels are both going down in trail. Okay. 
So our program is prevention focused, comprehensive, integrated, and continuously improving. We work collaboratively from all our different perspectives, but we work towards the same goal.